There it is. I heard the tone. (laughs) (laughs) Butterflies going in my tummy. The the tone of our people, eh? Yep. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So welcome to episode 10 of the PDS podcast. In today's episode, we'll be chatting with our guest about Flex Seal, McDonald's, and storm chasing. But before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Miracle Dent Repair. We'll hear a little bit more about them later in the show. Also, if you're watching us live right now, just remember that this is the raw and uncut version of the podcast, which means you may see or hear some things that don't make it into the final episode. Uh Also, during the break, you will have an opportunity to ask today's guests some questions of your own. So please send them to us in the comments and sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Our special guest for tonight is Dr. Reed Timmer. Reed is an American meteorologist and storm chaser who is known for starring Discovery Channel TV's series Storm Chasers, the documentary film Tornado Glory, and in the series Tornado Chasers. He also most recently worked with Mike Thies in the reality TV series Storms Rising on Disney+. Reed is also the creator and founder of Team Dominator, a series of armored storm chasing vehicles. Welcome to the show, Reed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Never stop chasing. <laughs> Glad to have you. So where where are you right now? Well, I'm in Searcy, Arkansas right now. We've got an ice storm that's happening. Pure freezing rain outside. Super cooled liquid water coming down, hitting everything, freezing on impact. Some of the roads are a little bit treacherous too, but I think by tomorrow morning, there's probably going to be close to about a half an inch of Ice accrual, that's the new word now, I think, for <laughs> simulation. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of ice out there tomorrow morning. And then I'm going to go look for quartz crystals tomorrow down on Mount Ida. So here in the Ozarks Mountain, mountains where uh, Ozark Mountains, where there's a lot of uplift and everything, it brings those quartz veins up to the surface. So I'm going to battle the ice storm with my McDonald's jacket and start digging points out of the ground tomorrow. <laughs> well, at least they'll be able to see you when you're digging. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so what t- or t- tell us what us and everyone that's listening what what is team dominator and what what do they do well the dominators are armored vehicles tank-like vehicles that have 16 gauge steel on the outside uh linex protective coating and they're designed to get up close to tornadoes if not inside so that we can collect data that other people can't safely collect And honestly, I was already intercepting tornadoes in beater vehicles, like my 1991 Mercury Topaz. Uh, I also had a Tempo, a double hand-me-down from my sister. I had an old extended cab truck that was a hand-me-down from my dad. And I was already intercepting tornadoes directly. So it made sense to give ourselves just a little bit of extra protection out there, (laughs) some armor, Lexan windows, and then we could get up close to tornadoes inside and also be uh, sheltered for uh, insurance purposes as well. That was kind of the main reason uh, <laughs> in addition to the science. But yeah, we've been intercepting them ever since. Now I've got the Dominator 4, which is kind of a beat up 2018 Subaru Forester covered in hail dents. I blow the windows out four to five times every year, but uh, I <laughs> still try to intercept tornadoes and, and even that. <laughs> So you have quite a few past and current projects involving Team Dominator, such as uh, Project Subsonic, Surgenator, Vivian, uh, WDN, and Gravitron. Can you tell us a little bit about these projects and what the goals have been with them? Certainly. So the modern version of Team Dominator uh, has Dominator 3 up in Canada, actually, in Saskatchewan. It's owned by Sean Schofer in Melville, Saskatchewan. Dominator 1 and 2 are down in Oklahoma City now, but you may remember from when we were working on Discovery Channel Storm Chasers, we were launching uh, by air cannon sensors into tornadoes. We were deploying ground-based probes, but the technology just wasn't quite right to track those sensors and to stream the data live. And many of the sensors that we launched into tornadoes, we never saw again. They traveled many miles away. The ones that would fall straight down to the ground, of course, were able to find those, but the technology just wasn't quite right. And we were working for an engineering company back then. And and then I met Mark Simpson, who's also Canadian. Chase Mm -hmm. and Spin on Twitter is his name. He's with the Twisted Chasers, uh, Storm Chaser Group. And he's the first person I met that actually has the ability to build these sensors and they can actually work really incredible technology. They can stream the data live down to a ground receiver. And I actually met 
Mark, just a couple of months, maybe a month or so before our first launch into the Linwood, Kansas tornado on May 28, 2019, uh, 2019 that actually Gizmo had her cast on, not 2017. Sometimes mm. I get those prime numbers of seven and nine, a little bit confused, but it's <laughs> a big year as well, but I know yeah. nine is not a prime number. I just get prime numbers sometimes <laughs> discombobulated with nine, but nine and seven, I seem to get a little bit confused. But anyway, 2019, we met Mark and then he built those sensors in like a, mat, a, a matter of about one or two months, a matter wow. of weeks. He was able to build those sensors. They worked. He had a receiver and a Tupperware container. The data would be streamed live at a rate of one hertz, one time every second. If we recover the sensor, then we can actually recover the 10 hertz data. But that's our rocket launcher project. We have that massive ro rocket launcher on the top of Dominator 3. And mm -hmm. uh, Curtis uh, Curtis Brooks, another Canadian up there, he's a, also a self-taught engineer. And he would go to all these different junkyards and uh, put together a bunch of different parts to make a, a rocket launcher with pan and tilt capability inside of the Dominator. And uh, in 2019, we finally launched a single rocket into a tornado, May 28, just southwest of Kansas City. And that uh, it, it works in a Lagrangian sense. So the rocket is only designed to go up just above the ground, and then the parachute pops out, and then the wind inside of the tornado will carry it up in a Lagrangian sense. Not necessarily Eulerian, but we want it to move with the flow, recording the data as it lofts up into the tornado and the mesocyclone above. And this one actually did two revolutions around the tornado and then lofted up above 30,000 feet before falling down about over 30 miles away from our original launch point. Wow. Yeah, you uh somebody got a hold of you on Twitter that found the uh found the rocket, I believe. Yeah, that's right. So we thought it was gone forever and we were paralleling the tornado. Mark is getting hit by pieces of debris. <laughs> Uh, homes were getting dislodged off to the east, and he pulled the receiver inside a little bit. But then once it got up above about 16,000 feet or so in the mesocyclone, we lost contact and thought we'd never see the sensor again. So yeah. we took a picture of the sensor, the bright yellow parachute probe with a nose cone, and posted it on Facebook. And in like a matter of minutes, someone reached out to us and said that they found it in the front yard of a church in Leavenworth, Kansas. So I went out there immediately and was able to to recover that sensor. That's wow, crazy. That's impressive. <laughs> the power of social media. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the power of a crowd is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so probably your most popular project at the moment would be the Dominator WX Weather Station. Yeah. When uh, when are those going to be available for purchase for the for the public? Well, they're going to be very soon. So Mark is working on those right now. And we did have some supply shortages uh, with the pandemic that's happening and with China and with technology in general that prevented us from rolling them out last storm season. But Mark has enough parts to produce about 20 of those. And it looks like here, probably a matter of weeks to maybe a few months, we're going to be rolling out those first Dominator weather stations and we'll have 20 ready to go right out of the gate, research grade weather stations mounted on vehicles as well. And the goal long term is to create a network of this data stream, a network of storm chasers that will all have one of these dominator weather stations on the roof. And it would almost be like a, a mesonet that naturally tightens around the weather systems of interest. So naturally, storm chasers uh, like honeybees on a on a flower or something will just you know, <laughs> would like to go toward the tornado. So I think it would naturally tighten up the resolution of the dominator weather stations. But we do plan to roll out those research grade weather stations in a matter of weeks to months, but in time for this storm season, certainly Mark's just building them with his bare hands. So he has all this equipment over there <laughs> to build all these sensor boards with his bare hands. And, uh, you know, it's incredible that he's able to make all that happen. I've, I've yeah, talked that's... to him a bit and he sent me some videos of what, what he's doing there. And it's, it's incredible. That's, he is a, he's a quite the magician, that guy. He yeah. is, yeah, an absolute <laughs> savant. And he's got musical talent as well. I think he's got perfect pitch too. So he's one of those people that just has a lot of talent. Just been blessed. <laughs> yep. So uh, how can I, oh, I mean, how can everybody else get uh, one of those Dominator uh, weather stations? Well, we have an email list right now that's at uh, Dominator, or domwxdata.com, dominatorwx.com as well. So we have an email list where people can sign up in advance, but really we need all these parts to come. We need Mark to gradually produce 
the weather stations. But we'll continue to post updates as we're moving forward to for this storm season when those are going to be ready. But we're going to have 20 ready to roll out. And I think we have about 2,000 pre-orders, too, for, for the weather station. <laughs> wow. I'm, I was, I, I'm terrified that that we're going to set up this weather station thing. And then Mark is just going to have to be building these all the time. So I'm a little bit worried for Mark that that might happen, but you know, we could also source out uh, some of the work to, to create those. He was actually trying to build his own uh, ultrasonic anemometer last year. So he was doing crazy huh. work with calibrating the ultrasonic anemometer and uh, that, and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have our own uh, ultrasonic as well at uh, Dominator WX. Nice. Uh, I think that uh, out of China, I think that there's one company that builds all the ultrasonic anemometers for all the companies where you can purchase them. You know, all the U.S., all the big companies, it seems like they kind of have a monopoly on the ultrasonic anemometers. So hmm. the crazy thing is that I think Mark was about to bust that monopoly wide open. So they're all <laughs> Twitter accounts, like tr tr tracking them and everything, you know, as he was posting <laughs> updates on the development of the the ultrasonic <laughs> anemometer because i think that they feared that their stranglehold on that equipment might might be about to get blown apart yeah wow but that's why they're so expensive you know you go to like one of the, some of these sites to get an rm young anemometer and they're like four grand yeah the equipment when the parts to go into something like that is a lot cheaper they're probably like a hundred dollars yeah. to the parts or yeah. something and that that makes a situation where only those people that are able to be associated with the university or get those big time grants through the government, only those people are, are able to do real science. And it, it seems like everybody mm. should be allowed to do science if they're in the position or near a tornado or in position to collect valuable data. So that's our mission is to kind of open the door for real science to everybody, not just, you know, the head of a university or a researcher at the university that uh, is able to to get a grant you know but we think that everybody should have the opportunity to collect data and do science that's awesome i like that answer <laughs> thanks so are there uh any plans on retiring dom four in the future no plan to retire dominator four <laughs> except if it just stops running so as long <laughs> as it continues to drive I'll keep chasing with it. It's kind of like an old pair of jeans. When you put on a familiar <laughs> pair of jeans, it just feels good, feels right. You know, you're about to start your day. And I have the same kind of feeling when I sit down into Dominator 4. I smell my musk. I smell the, the rotting <laughs> food that's in the car, you know, and it's, it's chase mode when I get in there. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Well, after what it's been put through so far, I think you, I think you got a long life ahead with Dom Four. Yeah, I'm sure I've got a, got an old poutine or something in there that's putting out a good smell. <laughs> well, it's that disappointing, you know. After these, after the pandemic and everything, I, I usually get a poutine every year uh, when I come up there to Storm Chase. Back in 20, 2015, when we were chasing the Tilston. Manitoba tornado, the tornado actually sucks my poutine out the window. So I had the poutine in my lap. I was about to enjoy it, about to enjoy those wonderful cheese curds sliding down my throat. And then right where we're about to intercept the tornado, the inflow kick, Sean had his window open. I had my passenger window open. The RFD happened and sucked the poutine out the window. And <laughs> oh. hit the ground. I think it was an A&W poutine too, which oh man, <laughs> That's criminal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you you kind of uh, started mentioning all who was involved in to Team Dominator, but who who is everyone that's involved in in that? Well, right now, uh, Sean Schofer is the driver of Dominator Three, the owner of Dominator Three. Uh, you've got Mark Simpson, who is the engineer, uh, builds all of our research equipment. Uh, you've got me, that's a storm chaser, and all the former members of Team Dominator, whether they want to be or not, they're still included in Team Dominator as well. Even if somebody quits the team, we'll still count them as Team Dominator. And anybody that wants to be a part of Team Dominator can be as well. Uh, you guys are a part of Team Dominator now. Welcome. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> but yeah, Dominator isn't necessarily an armored vehicle or a tank-like vehicle even. It's actually a state of mind and a style of storm chasing. So, you know, any vehicle can be called the Dominator. You don't have to drive into a tornado. It doesn't have to be covered in armor. It's just a, a passion for storm chasing and a style of aggressive hook slicing intercepts of tornadoes. Awesome. 
we don't wait in the path of it just southeast of it waiting for that you know potential rapid expansion we do hook slice maneuvers come from the rear of the tornado punch through that little rain and hail wrapping around the backside and then we're blessed with that beautiful high contrast look and we're also in the path of the tornado and we have softball size hail coming from the sky that's the bear's game and that's where we try to be with team dominator so speaking of that uh what are the strongest wind speeds you've taken any of the dominators into well the strongest one we ever measured was 155.2 miles an hour that was june 5th 2009 uh, just outside of LaGrange, Wyoming. That was the LaGrange tornado that we intercepted. It was rated an EF2, but we measured a wind gust of EF3 intensity inside of that one. And it was roping out, so it was constricting as it impacted the vehicle, so we didn't experience those winds for very long. Uh, yeah. But that was actually the strongest uh, wind that we ever measured, 155.2 miles an hour. We also measured 138.8 miles an hour in the Aurora, Nebraska tornado on June 17th just 12 days after that tornado in Wyoming. So we intercepted that one June 17, 2009. That was when the window was blown out by the suction vortex that ironically was coming around the backside of the tornado. Huh. Curtis, you're... Uh, you sorry, audio. Audio. sorry yeah. my heater <laughs> kicks in in the garage and it, uh, it's quite loud, so I mute myself while it's running. But uh, the real question that everyone wants to know is why do you spell Dominator 4 or Dom 4, F-O-R-E? It well, the Dominator 4 would have made sense, just a number 4, but as the vehicle started getting beaten up and covered in hail dents, uh, dimples all over the car, my uh, side mirrors have been blown apart, I lose about four to five windows a year, the sunroof is caved in, so I put a piece of aluminum over top. But I started to realize that it looked more like a golf ball, and so that's why... <laughs> F-O-R-E, like when you yell four when you're hitting a, go a, a golf ball or somebody accidentally hits somebody. Um, I, I grew up working on a golf course, you know, more maintenance. I was mowing grass. We'd peel off into the bushes, you know, and get our head right to mow, mow the fairways, the tee boxes, the rough and everything as well. And uh, so I do have, a, you know, a, a, an intimate relationship with the game of golf as well. And uh, I've had people yell four, you know, when the members are hitting the ball and I'd be out there mowing grass sometimes you'll take one right in the middle of your back so i think it just made sense that you know for f-o-r-e uh made sense to kind of play off the number four a little bit as well and also realizing that dominator is a state of mind a style of storm chasing and not necessarily a, a material possession so when when you said that you take a golf ball off the middle of the back now i'm picturing you out there like happy gilmore warming up for the season just getting dropped people to drive the balls at you just taking the hail that's all i can oh, see now not quite but i would be. yeah i'm not taking a golf ball into the small of the back but i did dish one out one time uh just about five years ago i was golfing with my friend aaron rupert out in norman oklahoma at westwood golf course and there was a group in front of us that appeared intoxicated they were playing really slow and i was about 220 yards out uh with a four iron and I thought I'd just roll it up a little bit on the green just to send a message, just to let them know, hey, we're back here, you know. <laughs> a little golf etiquette is needed. And I ended up hitting a career shot. This fade went through the air, and then it descended and hit the guy right in the middle of the back. It didn't even bounce. Hit him in the back, and I uh, put him on the ground. And it was like a bar fight playing out from 220 <laughs> yards away. It lasted about 45 minutes. These four guys had tattoos and everything, and they're running after the cart. And the incredible thing was that the golf cart, even with the governor, moved just fast enough so it was just faster than they could run. So these guys were <laughs> pissed off, and they ended up snapping my driver, throwing it back at me, whistled by my ear. And I turned the golf cart back around to get the head of my golf club, and these guys are trying to reach over my friend, trying to clock me and everything. And, and then finally I turned around, grabbed the club head, and as we're driving away, they're just running, slowly getting further and further back. And we just left the golf course to finish the last round. But there's a lot to this story that I, that I, I, did, I had to leave out. But it, it was about a 45-minute long ordeal. And you know, I, I probably should have just said, you know, said what they wanted to hear and defuse the situation. But where's the fun in that? that kind of yeah. <laughs> I feel bad about it, but I also don't. You know, they were, yeah, 
But I, no one was hurt, so that's the good thing. <laughs> it's most important. Have you guys ever the, hit somebody playing golf? I haven't, I but have my not. wife has driven a ball right into her old man's liver from about Ooh. 40 yards. Wow, that's not Ooh. good. When she Especially was, uh, in Canada, you guys need those livers up there. Right? <laughs> yeah, she hadn't hit a ball all day, so... Her, her dad and her brother, they, they went ahead of her and she finally caught, caught a hold of one and just dropped him like a sack of stuff. Wow. <laughs> but no, I have not. Yeah. yeah. I've taken a hailstone into the liver before. So I was driving her along in the passenger seat and had the window down and one came right in and hit me right in the soft area, right below the ribs. Right the soft area. I think that's where the liver's located. Saved your window though. <laughs> did, yeah. Yeah, I Silver don't linings. <laughs> I definitely don't mind losing a window or two. So, what would you say your favorite feature of Dominator Three is? Definitely the rocket launcher on the roof. That's yeah. my favorite feature. My uh, least favorite feature is actually the ability to deploy the Dominator to drop it to the ground in the spikes. Because every time I'm chasing in that, the driver of the Dominator 3 just wants to drop it down, even if we're like a half hour away. <laughs> and honestly, if I could rebuild the Dominator, I'd completely get rid of that feature. No deployment. Because <laughs> the problem with the Dominator is if you deploy, you're sitting there for 20 minutes. So once you drop it to the ground and the spikes go in, your chase is pretty much over. So mm. if you're going to deploy the Dominator, you want to be just about to get hit by the tornado in the path of the tornado. But if you're trying to do a hook slice, you can get a flat tire and just allow the tornado to move off to your east. And that's a, a viable escape route with a, the hook slice maneuver, where if you're in the path of the tornado there, it could hit you. It could expand down shear. Tornadoes don't mm. like to expand up shear. They don't like to paddle upstream without a paddle. Uh, so tornadoes in general, unless it's one of those stationary ones with dramatic deviant motions like a Bennington, Kansas or something, if you're approaching from the backside, mm. that's generally a good spot to approach. But down in Dixie Alley where they're moving at 60, 70 miles an hour, that just isn't an option down there. So Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess that kind of answers my next question, which was if you ever made a new Dominator, what's one thing you'd be sure to change? <laughs> <laughs> No yeah, I might no, more no deployment. All, more of an all-purpose vehicle too, kind of a vehicle that's capable of chasing all different storms. Uh, maybe a Dominator that could even float. So if we're chasing a hurricane and a storm surge comes in, we could just barrel into it, turn it into a boat, and start floating. Continue to collect data as well. But um, I think I'm just happy with the Dominator Four, kind of a beat up vehicle you know beaten down vehicle it, it, it's kind of uh consistent with kind of how i feel these days too you know <laughs> uh, kind of on brand a little bit for me you know i don't need some nice expensive car i'm kind of uh, now taking the approach to where you know i don't need to own the view to enjoy it you know absolutely i don't need to have any nice things anymore i think it's natural except your coat humans to try to <laughs> nice things you know and I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to gravitate away from that a little bit it i'd believe you a lot more if you weren't sitting there sporting that sweet coat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh i didn't realize there was arches on the back too yeah <laughs> Fries on the side, too. Do you see the fries on the Oh, man. <laughs> oh, that thing is money. Maybe even put some cheese curds and gravy on that, and you got a poutine on the side. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get a patch for the other arm for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so, I love the rocket launcher of the Dominator 3 because, you know, that's really the key part to get instrumentation into the tornadoes and – Curtis and Sean may design a big, massive launcher with multiple rockets along the top. And uh, I'm really hoping we can get the band back together, get the team back down in the U.S. now that the borders are open. And yeah, Sean, Curtis, and Mark, get Sean back behind the wheel, you know, and uh, just get everybody down there. It's been, it's been a couple of years now, and I, I wish we just chased anyway, you know, but <laughs> got to follow the rules. Yeah, stupid was, rules. <laughs> they made it hard to get down there, that's for sure. Yeah, and hard to get up into Canada. So, yeah, the last couple of years, the first time I haven't been up there in a long time since probably 2006 or five, 2005. Yeah, so yeah, the first time that I missed a couple of years, but you know, that's just selfish. You know, I understand <laughs> that 
you know, you guys get your poutine and tornadoes as well. So <laughs> I don't think it's enjoy it. But hopefully now that the pandemic, hopefully it's coming to a close and we can all meet up, hang out, storm chase, and you can see Gizmo again, Jordan, and <laughs> we're going to get our Canadian sure. friends back down. I just saw Tom Smetana is uh, going to be planning on chasing down in the U.S. Uh, as yep. well this year. Yeah, and really hoping Sean comes down. Yeah, I'm worried. So. I'm worried he's been locked up there in uh, Saskatchewan for too long. Be going squarely out in storm chase. <laughs> <laughs> he's been ice fishing lots. He has. Yeah, he's <laughs> been in that shed. It's in that shed, and uh, yeah. You got. You guys. Does every Canadian have an ice fishing fishing shed? Most, almost, or someone that has one. <laughs> yeah. You guys do as well. Yeah. Wow. I don't personally have one, no, but I know a lot of people with them. <laughs> you sleep in them and everything too, right? You can. No. Usually that's after too many beer, but you, okay. you can. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Gizmo. What what does she think of the of chasing and storm chasing and all of that? She loves chasing. She's been doing it since she was a little puppy. And uh, she's seen a couple hundred tornadoes Gizmo has. We were discussing before we went live how she had her cancer scare a couple of years ago and Gizmo's on the doggy CBD from Honest Paws. So I give her that and that has definitely improved her health. Uh, she has beautiful, shiny, soft fur now. She's very active as well. She beat the cancer a couple of years ago, but I was running after her, as I told you, and uh, had to do a Superman dive and rolled on Gizmo because she was about to make contact with a German Shepherd that actually ended up being her friend afterward. But I ended up snapping her paw, and she had a little peg leg during the 2019 season, uh, including the intercept that we had on May 17, 2019. Sean was in the Dominator 3, and I got separated from the vehicle, held Gizmo in my bread basket with the wind back behind us, and she was kind of sheltered there, and we were getting blasted by manure and wheat and everything from that freshly plowed field. I ended up getting pink eye for must have been about <laughs> two weeks after that. That I had to battle my eye. I touched my eye and the thing would just blow up. It was like a some kind of an autoimmune thing or something with my eyes. Uh, also my bronchial tubes from breathing in all that manure. So that was definitely an issue. But the lesser known dangers great. of storm chasing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those fields, there's some bad stuff on fields and, you know, like dirt, manure, uh, the little you know, crinkled up wheat that's in there too. I'm a little bit allergic to wheat. Uh, but that was uh, Gizmo's intercept on foot, and she's been storm chasing ever since. She's seen about 200 tornadoes, Category 5 hurricane. She was in Hurricane Michael back in 2018 as well, and she's been close to an EF5 tornado. She's been uh, chased to brief lows. Gizmo was actually hit by a tornado in my house in Norman, Oklahoma as well. So I was on a different storm in northern Oklahoma and actually missed the one that impacted my house. And Gizmo was in there with the Dominator 1 parked in the driveway, and we actually missed that tornado. So he's even intercepted tornadoes that I missed. <laughs> She's like, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. <laughs> so I, we, I see that you have a, a sponsorship with Flex Seal, and I saw a video of you getting your car put back together using it. So how many parts of your vehicle are actually held on with Flex Seal products now? Well, a lot. Uh, my bumper... <laughs> the roof the whole vehicle's waterproof so with uh, flex tape and uh, they've been an awesome sponsor they are my only sponsor right now uh so flex seal is incredible and they're supporting our science uh they're helping provide mark with uh equipment so he can waterproof the sensors as well and we use flex tape to mount the gravitrons and the storm surge sensors on poles and whatnot when tornadoes are moving through and uh when, the, when we're able to find the sensor, the flex tape works perfectly. But recently when I deployed in the bomb cyclone, the storm surge ended up taking out the whole entire dune, taking out the pole and everything, and we completely lost the sensor. But the uh -huh. flex tape definitely held. It's just that the pole got dislodged from the, uh, from the dune. But that's another project that we're working on, the surgeonator sensors that Mark designs. And uh, those are based on the pressure weight of the water. They're able to measure and stream live the depth of floodwaters and storm surge. And they're also able to measure the salinity of the water and other atmospheric pressure and then stream all that data live. So that's wow. another project that, that we have going on uh, with flex tape and also the drone racing that we're doing. The goal is to 
fly a racing drone right up to a tornado, ride the surface inflow in, and then rock it straight up along the corner flow where it makes a 90 degree angle with the ground. You get rapid uplift as well where that when that surface inflow hits the vortex. So our goal with the racing drone is to haul ass toward the tornado and then rock it straight up and then fly up and down the edge of the tornado <laughs> measuring data of how we're doing it. Another wow. thing we're trying to do is just land the racing drone in the path of the tornado and let the tornado move over it so that we can measure surface pressure data and other meteorological data at the surface. That's crazy. That's, <laughs> yeah, so do you guys that's all cool. have greens? Do you both have green screens behind you? Yes, yep. sir. So that's that software, right? Is it, what's it called? Black Magic or something? No, this is actually built right into the platform we're using right now, StreamYard. Yeah. Fantastic. So you could actually build a green screen behind StreamYard and then just have whatever image you want back there? Absolutely. Yep. So I've got a literal screen of green back here. Wow. <laughs> I've got the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, <laughs> Which feels just like home, you know, when you come into a Hampton Inn or a Holiday Inn or a Motel 6 and they have this this same uh, color scheme and artwork. It just makes me feel at home. I get my best night's sleep in a hotel because it, it feels so much like home. <laughs> you probably spend more nights in a hotel than you do at home. Definitely. Probably. I, don't really have, I have an apartment in Colorado now that I'm never there, but I pretty much live on the road full time now. I crash at my mom's place in upstate South Carolina quite a bit. I'm that 41-year-old that lives with his mom. <laughs> there is your new Tinder profile. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I am non-sexual. The last five to six years, uh, I am just pure commitment to storm chasing, mountain biking, golf, science, and gizmo. Gizmo, I would say, is my the love of my life, my life partner. She is uh, Gizmo's awesome. We're uh, like two peas in a pod. That's terrific. Right on. <laughs> yeah, but no Tinder, no way. I, 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 I process, you know. I'm done with that. What a waste of time, you know. <laughs> Unless you're going to reproduce, you know, or you want to have a family, which, you know, at this point, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I, I used to want to have a family when I was younger and all the way through my 30s, but at this stage. I'm just going to storm chase into the sunset for the next 50 to 60 years with medical advancements. There you, you go, stop, man. Yeah. What do you think? We'll be just storm chasing <laughs> until we're two, 300 years old with medical advancements. They're just going to put your brain into a dominator 18 and away you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> brain in a jar right on top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think the question everybody wants to know is how many uh, miles per gallon does Dom three get? You spelt that wrong. It's gallons Dominator per mile. Three or four. <laughs> Dominator four does pretty good gas mileage, but Dominator three is a diesel, so it does better than you might think, like twelve or True. thirteen miles a gallon. <laughs> so we, we would go electric, but problem is I don't think there's enough charging stations yet across the Great yeah. Plains and our plains and ca Canadian prairies. We and they're to, expensive. I mean, need to figure out how to harness the lightning. <laughs> yeah, instant <laughs> yeah, charge. The light. Yeah. Hey, Mark, you know your next step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark, if you're watching, let's get a uh, let's get an electric solar power dominator if we can. <laughs> or nuclear fusion, something like that. <laughs> well, I guess that takes us to our first break. Uh, if anybody that's watching has any questions, uh, now is your time to ask them before we get on with the uh, rest of the show here. So there are a few here that I've starred as they as they came in. Okay. Violet WX wants to know if you have a favorite storm or tornado, or a more the most memorable hurricane or tornado. I guess. I certainly do, and it actually happens to be a tornado in Canada, the June twenty third two thousand seven tornado, the Pipestone Manitoba tornado, which I think was obviously an F five. Uh, it was a day after the first F5 that hit Eli, Manitoba, the day before on June 22nd, 2007. Mm. And I should have seen that tornado. I was heading north and decided to go up the Northwest Passage, up through Minot and further northwest, and ended up sitting out uh, uh, June 22nd, uh, the Eli tornado, or else I would have seen it by accident. That was kind of a less obvious setup. Uh, yeah. A little bit more of a mesoscale accident, whereas we were targeting the day after that on June 23rd, where... 
all the variables were maxed out. Like the zero to one EHIs were like almost double digits on that day, like 6,000 Cape, three to 400 zero to one kilometer shear, easterly winds at the surface, flipping around to westerly aloft. You had elements of the high plane shear meets traditional Great Plains, maybe not as much Dixie Alley type shear with that event, but uh, and then we chased the storm and it was initially relatively high based as it was moving over the Moose Mountains, but a perfectly circular saucer. You knew the thing was capable of going nuts, but we chased it for a long time as that high base storm and started thinking, wow, maybe this isn't going to produce. Went way off to the east, dropped south, turned back to the northwest. It was one of those classic high plane setups of the RFD surging way off to the east, the tornado way back behind it. So you're getting RFD even though you're southeast of the tornado. And then, bam, the first large tornado happened to the west of Pipestone. We were a little bit out of position for that one. Went north into Pipestone, and then the new circulation was forming. Perfectly cylindrical wall cloud, convective up and down, very crisp left side. One of the most textbook wall clouds I've ever seen. And you could see the rotation, perfectly laminar as well. And then it quickly put down a large white cone tornado that we were south of, crossed the road just to our west expanded into a very large wedge three vortices and back then people didn't storm chase very much in canada so Mm -hmm. you know i mean maybe a handful of people i know dave carlson used to storm chase back then he was really the only canadian storm chaser that i knew of back then pat boomer was working the high plains up there in alberta as well Uh, i know there were some tours that were up storm chasing cod was on that tornado i know chuck doswell went up there and crossed that border illegally that one time a couple (laughs) years before that they had the cone set up and he just blasted through the border i think they got caught i think it was the tempest tours or something back then but they got caught on the other side of the border and got in big trouble of course these days that was way before uh 2001 uh but yeah, that was uh, 2007 up in Canada. And then we went over to Brandon, Manitoba, and went to one of those bars there. That I'm not going to tell you what type of bar it was, but uh, <laughs> one with the island in the middle. And there's like a moat around it with everybody. <laughs> and that was one of my first times experiencing a Canadian beer. And, you know, and every, everyone was uh, out there having a good time in Brandon, Manitoba, and loved the town. I love kind of the merger of the conifers that you get with the Great Plains up in Canada as well. And you could storm chase till like 11 o'clock and still see everything. So we we got on that storm like at 1130 at night and you could still see a lot up there. But you definitely get more of those high plains types of setups. So the easterlies at the low levels flipping around to westerly and easterlies go up about two kilometers before flipping around. It's a different type of setup, but more of those high plains like eastern Wyoming type setups, eastern Colorado, except you have a lot more moisture and a lot more cape up there. So definitely love chasing Canada, love the Canadians, love poutine. But that was one <laughs> of my more memorable ones uh, that I, 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 I'm i certain was an F5. Bennington, uh, Kansas is another one of those that I'm certain was an F5 as well, moving very slow, did a figure eight. Sean Schofer and I nearly bit the bullet on that one because we ran on foot out to the inflow region, had a shoulder-mounted air cannon uh, that was powered by compressed air. The goal was to launch a sensor from the inflow of the tornado. And I told Connor and the Dominator 1 and 2, hey, come pick us up right after we launch. And so we ended up having to run about a half mile to get to the northerly inflow that was feeding into the tornado, launched, and then realized that Connor wasn't coming to get us. <laughs> so I had to run against about a 90 mile an hour easterly on the north side of the tornado. Barely made it back to the Dominators, get in the car. And then we go counter to the tornado's motion just on its north side. We blast west as the tornado did this figure eight configuration. And we actually deployed a sensor on a barbed wire fence in the path of that tornado. And it came in and mowed everything out. The barbed wire fence was gone. Everything was swept clean, and we never saw the sensor again. And that tornado was so stationary that it actually took cattle, all the cattle herd that was around, and piled it up into the middle of the tornado. So there was a pile of cattle carcasses in the middle of that tornado left behind. And we believe that the sensor is buried deep in there somewhere along with that barbed wire fence. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, that's a memorable one. And uh, the the EF5, Philadelphia, Mississippi, the super outbreak was a crazy tornado. The entire 2011 season was absolutely asinine. 
Uh, during April of 2011, over 700 tornadoes, the most tornadoes recorded in a single month anywhere uh, on planet Earth. Usually, you know, I think the, net, the second most uh, during a given month was less than 300 during 1974 in April. 2004, you had the, uh, in May, you had a bunch of tornadoes too, which I kind of botched that season up a little bit, except for some of those tornadoes. But definitely that 2011 was insane. And I think this year is going to be similar. I know it's taboo to include 2011 because it's such an outlier, but it's also one of the only years where you have a year two La Nina, you have an uh, untapped Gulf of Mexico, you have more importantly, the cold PDO, which is associated with the year two La Nina as those cold anomalies migrate mm -hmm. Calvin wave propagation along the Northeastern periphery of the Pacific. And then even more importantly, you have the warm blob that is the North Pacific oscillation, the North Pacific and the North Central Pacific. So you get that ridge a little bit further west and it encourages the formation of a Western US trough. And I think we've seen it play out late fall through the winter where you get those little uh, short waves in the Pacific Northwest that amplify and then bottom out in Northern Mexico and eject really quickly. 2011 was similar to that where you'd be chasing in the, the Texas Panhandle, then you'd be in Mississippi, then you'd be in North Carolina three days in a row as that system ejects. You have a consolidated jet stream due to La Nina instead of a split flow pattern. But mm -hmm. I think that the El Nino-like patterns that we see it are more related to warm water being in the subtropical Pacific and even along the PDO horseshoe. And I think that encourages those split flow patterns, whereas the subtropical jet will just hammer the base of those troughs and cause them to deepen a little bit too early and cut off. And that's why you get a lot of flooding rainfall in the, the southern plains and you have an energized subtropical jet like that. So instead of just you know not even acknowledging 2011 because it's such an outlier, <laughs> I try to look at it as from a meteorological perspective. I know we're probably not going to have a super outbreak or the most active April in history, but I do think that the troughs are going to follow that pattern where they start off as short waves in the Pacific Northwest, amplify, bottom out across northern Mexico, pick up a stout elevated mixed layer, and then eject it across a warm sector. I think we saw that on December 10 and 11. We saw it on October mm -hmm. 10 and 12. We saw it in that event in uh, November when Purdue, Missouri was hit, had a day off in Oklahoma. Then you had Beaumont, Texas going nuts. Dixie Alley has been active December 10 and 11, January 31st, or December 31st, January 1st. Just recently here, the Sawyerville tornadoes, these lower end outbreaks that are overperforming. So I'm looking more at the shape and the evolution of the of the uh, upper level pattern and then try to relate that to the sea surface temperature climate in the Pacific, which is thankfully conveniently located upstream of North America. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Just that I kind of like the climate system and all that, which even though it's a lot of information, it could very easily be inaccurate too. You know, so. <laughs> but if you say it with I'm authority, really you're good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you say it with a McDonald's jacket, it makes it right. That's right. <laughs> so the Nader Chaser wants to know if you've ever been struck by lightning. No, I haven't. I've been close many times, but uh, I have not been struck by lightning. I, I maybe caught a streamer off of one. But uh, as far as I know, I haven't been struck by lightning yet. <laughs> I like that as far as you know. <laughs> From what I remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sandy Kern wants to know how many miles Dom 4 has on it. Dominator 4 has about 180,000 miles, and I got it brand new in 2018. So zero miles on it. And uh, sorry, I got a little bubbler here in the, in the tummy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, Dominator 4 has about 180,000 miles on it. I got it brand new with no miles. I still owe about 20 grand on the vehicle from the bank. <laughs> just so, just take it back to them. One of those. <laughs> I'm upside down. <laughs> Man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Adam Young would like to know what your favorite chase you did in Canada was, and I think you said that that was Pipestone. Yeah, Pipestone, uh, but second favorite, uh, Tilston, Manitoba, certainly. And another favorite, uh, kind of a love-hate, was that, that uh, rope tornado, that bright white rope 
uh, back in 2013. I think it was about July 3rd or so, and I saw that rope. And that's because I picked up the back hatch of the follow vehicle at the time, and I was trying to launch an RC remote control uh, vehicle into the tornado for some reason. It was a stupid idea. Uh, but I opened the back hatch, and as I was trying to grab the RC vehicle, I hit my head on the corner of it. And I feel all this blood start oh, streaking no. down over my face, and I hit it real uh. hard, so I was a little out of it and everything. And the tornado is about 200 yards away to our southeast, and we ended up intercepting it anyway. And that was actually the first time that I met Sean Schofer. So Sean was working with uh, Greg back then, uh, uh, and uh, he uh, came up to the vehicle and brought a first aid kit. He's a firefighter, you know, always prepared and everything, and came up. I had this big uh, patch of blood on my hat, and uh, we put a piece of duct tape on it and uh, kept the chase up. And then eventually I went to the hotel, fell asleep, and I woke up, and the whole bed was covered in blood. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the doctor and they gave me a steroid shot and then uh, went up to Alberta and hung out with Braden Morso, Canadian chaser up there. And we went and uh, started observing the elk uh, from close range up there. And then I was able to heal uh, up in Alberta. So that was a good healing experience. <laughs> uh, Sydney Shive would like to know. She is majoring in meteorology, and she'd like to know if you have any tips about getting through all the math and science. Well, the key is just to get through it, and your passion for meteorology will help you get, get through uh, all of the math and the science. The science is a little easier. The math uh, can be a little bit more difficult. But if you're the kind of person that hates math or you think you're not good at math, it's probably the fact that you had a bad teacher back in the day. And if you have a good professor, a good teacher of math that's passionate about it, then everything will click and you'll have a much better experience. So if maybe you're not happy with math, don't shy away from finding a different teacher as well or somebody that you know is more passionate about teaching you math as well. But the key is just to get through it. You got to memorize all the equations and everything. Meteorology is pretty much all about memorizing the equations that supercomputers will solve to predict uh, out in the future for storms. Uh, but you know, once it, once it does click, it's a beautiful thing too. And you realize that mathematics are more of a language that describe motions in the atmosphere that you can see with your own eyes. And uh, once you start solving those problem sets and you arrive at a, a solution that works, it can definitely give you a sense of accomplishment but once you get through all the math, you have your degree forever. You probably won't have to revisit those equations again, but you do understand <laughs> generally how they work. And then you can just allow the supercomputers to solve them. But don't be shy about changing professors. If you're having trouble in a class and you're really trying hard to learn and everything, it's probably that professor that is half-assing it. Excellent. Uh, Shane Armstrong wants to know what the tornado sounds like when you're inside one of the DOM machines. Well, it sounds like a really loud waterfall. So a tornado has very strong winds. There's a lot of small water droplets that are rubbing up against each other and everything. So that's why it sounds a lot like a waterfall, not as much like a train to me, but you hear this kind of low frequency roar, uh, which you definitely hear a lot of audible frequencies. There's a lot that you can't hear too which is, uh, that's kind of the premise behind developing the subsonic sensor that Mark built to be able to hear those infrasound frequencies, uh, really low frequency sounds that you might be able to measure for much longer range of a tornado and might even be useful for prediction of tornadoes or discriminating between non-tornadic and tornadic supercells. And I think there's only one more. CT wants Gizmo. to know where Gizmo is and what her favorite part of chasing is. All right, CT. Uh, Gizmo's favorite part of storm chasing are the chicken nuggets. So <laughs> she loves McDonald's chicken nuggets, and I peel the skin off, the fried skin and breading, and then that non-chicken meat in the middle that's definitely not chicken, I'm sure. That's what she loves. <laughs> it's chicken -ish. She loves food. Gizmo loves food, and she likes human food, so... You know, I've never been the kind of person that's just going to only give my dog kibble. You know, I'd feel really bad for the dog. So, And I know Gizmo tastes because when she tastes something that's good, she sticks her tongue all the way out, like savors it and everything. So we try to give Gizmo a good quality of life as well while also being, being healthy. She's on the CBD treatment as well, which 
honest paws if you do have a dog and you want to give them a cbd treatment honest paws is a great place to purchase that medicine and it really will result in a very healthy dog it, i swear it helped gizmo beat cancer <laughs> all right all right i think we're caught up there is a pile of comments here so if i missed your questions i'm sorry i i'm really trying to keep up with them all <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm gonna go grab a I'm going to go grab a refill on my drink here quick before we get back. Okay. Into it. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll if you go, need to uh, if you need to take a break to read by okay. all means. I'll use the restroom. I got some chilies here as well. <laughs> I could always eat that during, but uh, I'm going to I got some uh, fajitas and southwest egg rolls that are good. Nice. There's a scarf tornado I see. That was a Yes. A tornado that. So I'll be right back in a table yep. later. Oh, you can eat your supper. It's fine. <laughs> oh, no. I, I'll wait till after. I'm going to micro, <laughs> microwave it and uh, yeah, infuse some medicine into it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we've got two more segments here. We've got the 21 questions and then the trivia, and we'll let you go enjoy your supper. Okay. Yeah, no worries. This has been I, fun. I think the Good trivia is going to be right up, right up your alley here. It's fast food <laughs> trivia tonight. Love hearing the, the Canadian accent, too. I really miss it. <laughs> I, I grew up in Michigan, actually. That was relatively close to Canada, so we kind of have a hybrid accent. That's, we, we, we uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not even going to. I don't have the, okay. I, I, even though I was in Oklahoma for 20 years, I never, never lost a Michigan or accent. My sister, on the other hand, developed a Southern accent in like two months of living down there. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, we'll hear from our sponsor here really quick, and then we'll get back into the show. Hail damage. It can happen at any time, and when it does, bring it to the hail repair specialists at Miracle Dent, because dents are what we do. Our paintless dent repair process maintains your original factory finish with no repainting or parts to order. You'll have your vehicle with its original factory paint back in no time like it never happened. If Mother Nature has put a dent in your summer, come to Miracle Dent Repair. Dents are what we do. Perfect sponsor for Dominator 4. Absolutely. Yeah, I, was <laughs> I meant to make that connection after the first sponsor run, and then I forgot, and then now you're it again. And I can bring it up there and see if they can pull some of those dingers out. Well, we might even have a gift card or two we could give you for there. Yep. Yeah, I got a couple gift cards here from them. <laughs> I would love to see the the look on their face when Dom four wheeled in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, I returned some rental cars back in the day after completely destroying them. One in uh, eastern Wyoming in 2018. I was driving up after the tornado, and I was still probably four miles away when it first touched down, and I got a flat tire because I was driving on this crazy road, canyon road. Got a flat tire, and I had the decision, do I stop and fix the tire and miss the tornado? No, you don't do that. You drive on the rim, and then you intercept the tornado. <laughs> so I just driving, blocked it out. You know, I totally evaporated the tire, and I'm driving on the rim when I finally got up to the tornado. Hook slice maneuver, softballs going around. The tornado started wobbling back toward me, 
And then it hit the town of Federal, Wyoming, just northwest of Cheyenne. And there was a man that took shelter and he came out of his shelter. He had two Siberian Huskies. And I also ran into softball size hail, blew some of the windows out, dented the whole entire exterior of the vehicle. And then I let him take shelter in the car, of course, and the Siberian Huskies just destroyed the back of the car. <laughs> just shredded the interior and the exterior. I, eventually, he helped me put on a donut tire as well, and I ended up driving it back to Denver. All the windows blown out, donut tire, like uh, back of the car shredded. And I pulled in, and they were clapping. They were standing in a circle around, and everybody was clapping when I uh, returned it. And they had a bunch of hail around the area too, but it was obviously the worst damaged car they had ever seen. And they were <laughs> laughing, celebrating. And I realized that the people that check in your vehicle and the employees of the rental car company, they don't care whether it's covered by insurance or not. They just appreciate good damage. <laughs> they just like seeing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just witnessing it. It's like, look at this thing. There's nothing left on here. Yeah. What did you do to it? <laughs> so we've started doing this thing uh, where we ask our guest if they have a question for our next guest. And in the last episode, we had Michael Blin Olbinski on the show, and he left the following question for you. Haboobs oh. or tornadoes? Tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, haboob is, uh, a haboob is like chasing a squall line, except it has dirt in it. And it makes it look beautiful <laughs> with the dirt. <laughs> Definitely makes them very photogenic, but uh, I would even chase debris flows and flash flood. But I love haboob, so it's definitely up there. You know, it's, uh, I, I would say that I would chase a, I would prefer chasing a haboob over a hurricane. Yeah, really. Yeah, a hurricane is like standing in a squall line, except for like twelve hours. You know, yeah. you're driving it, the winds are you know maybe one thirty, one forty or so. You can still drive in those barely if you keep the vehicle pointed into the wind, but. It's not as much of a chase as you just kind of park in the path of it, let it blow over you, try to get content out, try to collect data the best you can. Everybody's panicking. Most people mm -hmm. evacuate. The people that stay behind are a lot of times crazy people, crazy storm chasers, corrupt police officers all in one group. And it's more about the human element than it is about the meteorology with a, a hurricane chase in a lot of ways, which I think is great and everything. But Tornado chasing, then, is the pure chase finesse game where you're trying to get close to the tornado. You're trying to anticipate its next move. Is the storm going to cycle? Do you need to navigate roads? You know, it's definitely more of a chase, I think, by definition. Whereas, you know, a, a haboob is a, is a bit of a hybrid, a little bit more of a chase. But you're also kind of just waiting for it to come to you. You're setting up your tripod in the path of it, standing there, just kind of watching it. You know, and, uh, and and so it's more of a hybrid, a chase, and you're waiting uh, to allow it to get to you. But but mm. I still love chasing hurricanes as well. But ice storms I do chase as well. But tornadoes and, <laughs> and giant hail and debris flows, flash floods are my, my favorite. But haboobs, way up there. You know, I, I'd rather chase a haboob than a, than a mega shelf squall line, but I would, I would love to chase both of them. <laughs> So our next guest uh, is going to be Jessica Moore, and do you have a question for her? Yeah, do I have to come up with it right now? Nope, nope. you can nope. let us know later. Okay, but <laughs> I, I, I do uh, have a question right now. Um, do you think that uh, or it's, it's got to be related to NFTs, I would think? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, uh, photography, NFTs rogue storm chaser but uh i want to think about it. i want to come up with a really good question instead of just coming up with one on the fly and i've got a, uh, i have a lot of respect for jessica and uh i want to come up with a good question but i think it might involve nfts a little bit because I, it's definitely something i've been trying to decide is it something i should get into is it something where i should take a photo of gizmo and roll out a gizmo line is it something that maybe isn't for me <laughs> So it's definitely something that's uh, related to that space because I've definitely seen a lot of storm chasers start to pursue that angle. And I'm all about angles that allow storm chasers to be able to make a living doing what they love, whether it be social media streaming, making it possible to, uh, for a pathway for independent content contributors to generate content and make a living, or whether it be through, for NFTs, which has been a great platform for photographers and for storm chasers to 
make ends meet uh, following their passion. So I always support these renegade communities. They always start off renegade and then they become mainstream. Mm -hmm. But I always support those pathways that make it possible for the storm chaser, just the average storm chaser to make a living uh, doing it as well. And, and uh, because a lot of times, you know, media and content is controlled by a big corporation. They only allow it for a couple of people to have a job doing it. And, and they may or may not even be passionate about it, but mm. social media and has opened the floodgates to allow anybody with a passion or talent to possibly even make a living doing what they love. So that's why I, I love the uh, NFT space. I love social media that's made it possible uh, to really allow us to take advantage of our independent spirit and uh, make a living doing what we love. Absolutely. Well, yeah, if, uh, yeah, just I'll send think us about a message, it John. To you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. My file damage, my file access system in my brain is a lot slower now, I think, due to just years and years of chasing and burnout. So a lot of times once I sign off of these podcasts, then I'll remember. Oh, I should have thought of that. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've just it's got a little bit of a lag that's baked in. Unfortunately, I, I can't access my. It's all good, uh, buddy. But yeah, Jessica will be a great guest and I'll tune in but i would love to hear more about how the nft space is going absolutely so and now, is there any room is there any room for the yahoo storm chaser in nfts <laughs> <laughs> i hope so i'm a yahoo and it, it does feel a little bit like the yahoo style of storm chasing is kind of a dying breed a bit you know, a, it's too many people can see everything that's happening now <laughs> everyone yeah, has a camera so in their head you get up close to a tornado with a potato phone, you know, and that, that <laughs> got to still be a space for the Yahoo storm chaser like me. <laughs> Speaking of that, now it's time for a 21 question segment where we're going to get to learn all about your Yahoo lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> Yay. So what I want to know is what's your secret model or your secret weapon for reading the models or predicting tornadoes? Boy, what is that one thing that you have to have? I think you got to control your information flow. So I kind of come a little bit from the old school style of Storm Chaser, where you had uh, not as many models that were available and you kind of knew their biases and their weaknesses a bit. And you start your Storm Chase and then you don't get any information coming in at all till the end. And then you see what people got, you post your video. But now all the information is real time. There's radar data coming in. You get flooded with 500 different opinions of what their forecast is. <laughs> Unsolicited most of the time. You know, I, I get text just blowing up. This is what I think. I think it's going to be here. I think it's going to be over here. Next thing you know, you totally forget what your own forecast was. So <laughs> I think it's, and that, that's causing everybody to kind of move as a herd a little bit with the same forecast, the mainstream forecast that gets picked up by social media and whatnot. And, and you, you don't really have anybody that's working the secondary or tertiary targets as much. And so I think my secret is to try to exist in a vacuum as much as you can before the chase <laughs> so that you can kind of maintain your own forecast a little bit. You can learn a lot more that way. And filtering information, I think, is the key to being a successful storm chaser these days because there's so much information come in you just get discombobulated and have no idea what your original forecast was eventually you even forget your name you know and uh, where <laughs> the tornado is where you're located and so <laughs> my goal moving forward is to try to control the information flow and try to exist in a vacuum the best i can until the uh, storm is intercepted and then resume summer camp everybody meets up at applebee's we share our story <laughs> share our forecast in hindsight how it worked how it didn't work but I do love uh, I love the NAM models just because I know their biases a bit more. There's always a new model and a new update these days and something new that's wrong. And so it's very difficult to stay in tune with the model biases as well these days and to even have a favorite model because there are so many different models, so many different tools these days. It sure seems like models are getting less accurate with time, especially <laughs> in medium, medium to long range. <laughs> but I, I could be wrong with that you know that, that that could be false but it just seems like forecasts or it was a little easier to forecast back in the day so what is something interesting that most people don't know about you well i collected insects when i was younger so i was a big bug collector i was in science olympiad 
I didn't go through puberty till about the age of 25 or so. So I was in science <laughs> collecting insects. Also played the oboe. So I went to Summers at Interlochen. And uh, so even though my name's Reed, coincidentally, I'm actually, I'm named coincidentally after the mouthpiece of the oboe, but it was <laughs> But I love the oboe. I wish I could play that again. You know, I played all the way through college, and uh, it was definitely a good balance for storm. Well, that sounds again. like something you should have in Dom 4 with you to pass the time while you're waiting for a storm. Yeah, bring out the oboe. Just... <laughs> yeah, I can still play it. I can still. It's kind of one of those things where you just get back on a bike, I think. You don't really yeah. talk about it too much. What do you enjoy most about presenting the weather? Like weather briefings? Yeah. Uh, this is when he's accessing the data. Yeah. I like the <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's buffering. <laughs> yeah, I like to ticker that scrolls are, uh, along the bottom. I, that was just kind of a new thing that I added on there, that little ticker that says like, uh, PDS is in effect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. PDS tornado watch. I like the ticker. I, I do like uh, getting excited when I'm looking at the models and then sharing it with people as well. I like the comments that are coming in when I'm doing weather briefings. So, those are fun. but I'm not very good at, at uh, presenting the weather. I don't think so. It's not one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> so, a little self conscious about it, but. But I, well, I, try to I think it. you've got a pile of people that really enjoy watching you and listening to you present the weather. Oh, I agree. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. How, how did you get interested in the weather? Well, I've loved it ever for as long as I can remember. And uh, my first tornado experience was when I was about five years old. And my dad was pulling us in a wagon to go catch minnows. Mm -hmm. And there was a tornado warning that was issued. And we were coming back to the, uh, my mom's house. And uh, he was pulling us walking really slow the same speed the whole time even though the sirens were blaring i remember the chaos as well the newspaper delivery man would often ride his bike with no handlebars and he's just hauling ass with no not holding onto the handlebars just zipping out in one of the driveways so i remember that happening everyone fleeing the tornado my mom stuck her head out the window and just started going nuts get back here tornado warning just flip it out <laughs> <laughs> the whole chaos of it and that that must have led to a, an obsession with tornadoes starting at about age six or so oh that's awesome Eighty six. <laughs> and then of so course you know a twister happened and uh that was not late 90s i was uh i was already had already had some storm chases under my belt when it started but the whole twister thing you know just ramped up the stoke factor about storm chasing just <laughs> realizing yes. that holy cow you know there's actually a career path where you could follow your passion of observing and intercepting storms i'm not as passionate about the physical sciences honestly and the mathematical I, I i wasn't very good at meteorology i just loved it so much i was better at the life sciences and insect collecting and bioprocess events and just kind of pure memorization a little a bit more but i decided to follow my passion and go into meteorology and but, you know, I'm not a natural mathematician or programmer or physical scientist as much as a savant. For example, like Mark, you know, he's a, your textbook expert physical scientist, I would say, with elite mathematical skills and programmer. And, I, you know, I, I wish that I had that. But I, I was definitely more of an insect collector, nature, uh, life sciences. But my true passion was always in weather, severe weather and storm chasing. Who has been your most important professional mentor? Um, I definitely have some people that uh, inspired me for sure. Uh, Jeff Petrowski was a huge inspiration. Tim Marshall was a big inspiration as well. He actually sent me VHS tapes of his footage when I was growing up. Uh, but I think I'm kind of one of those mentorless people, you know, that when you grow up in storm chasing a little bit, it, it was kind of a young community, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the old guard that was there, they were more kind of hating on the fact that storm chasing was becoming popular. So I kind of had an opposite experience. A lot of those 
older original storm chasers were kind of mean actually when we first started trying to get us out of storm chasing get us out of meteorology at any cost competing with you you know mm. when they close to those older folks they, they weren't very nice they, they'd even put up whole entire websites people that work at the spc now they put up these massive websites just hater websites and i was like an 18 19 year old 20 year old kid at the time and these professional meteorologists were put like devoting these whole entire websites to being a hater. Roger <laughs> Edwards, those guys. That's Jeez. terrible. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. I think that's just natural human instinct. You know, as we get older and younger people start taking over and the popularity starts to intensify. So my goal is as I get older to be the opposite of what I experienced and to try to help people show them the path of storm chasing, show them a path of meteorology. And even though it might be natural for your testosterone and you know, your hormones <laughs> to say, I want to compete with this guy, you know, this isn't good, even though he's 20, 30 years younger than you, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a lot more fulfilling if you help them and mentor those people and show them a path of storm chasing. But unfortunately I consider myself one of the mentorless people and I definitely do wish that I, I had one back in the day to kind of show me the path but I also am thankful that that happened so that I can show other people the path you know and kind of learn from that you know I, I think that's sometimes why if you have a bad parent or something it a lot of times skips a generation because you can kind of learn from something and try to do better yourself so that's what mm -hmm. I would do for storm chasing is to support the community rather than hate on it that's an incredibly healthy way to look at that absolutely you have to force it though you know because it's, it's not a natural way to be i feel like some of these older people they still want to steamroll you and compete against you and ego you know is a big issue and so uh, you got to sometimes put that aside and try to show people the path more so than anything and then i think it'll be a much more fulfilling existence when when you have to pass away absolutely never absolutely. stop chasing <laughs> so what what has changed the most since you started chasing well the popularity is incredible i mean there are tons of storm chasers out there the technology has changed dramatically the advent of social media uh, when i first started chasing in the mid late 90s we had to pull over and go to libraries you get a library card at every little library town you look at information you find your target and then you leave that information and then drive to where the tornado is happening now there's a continuous flow of information coming in a need for continuous updates to even stay afloat if you're working for an accuweather or working for social media you got to keep real-time updates if not stream live non-stop and uh it's exhausting but that's the way that things are now as well so uh you know, but boy, has it changed dramatically over the last 25 years. And I'm sure that the people that were kind of ending their storm chasing career when I was beginning maybe felt the same way, uh, I would think. So what did you do as a job before you got into storm chasing? Well, uh, storm chasing has been my full-time job since since two, since 99, I would say. So it's been my full-time job since then, but I, I still worked at a golf course, uh, mowing grass, tee boxes, cleaning clubs growing up. Uh, that's where I worked uh, in the golf course business. And then over the summers, early college, I would come back and mow grass as well and got fired actually because of storm chasing. So <laughs> ended up blasting all the way to Nebraska from Michigan, storm chasing, and then came back and Pretty sure I got fired then, but the key to storm chasing is you have to work like five or six different jobs at the same time too, because <laughs> yeah, so you're always working that many jobs and you get fired a lot. You get new jobs. You got to keep a lot of burgers on the grill. Like sometimes when I'm out storm chasing, I'm doing as lies for AccuWeather. I'm slinging reports to Ryan Hall, y'all, and posting to my, you know, my social media as well. I'm doing sponsor stuff, flex tape videos that I have to edit every day, three videos a month, 10 lives a month. You know, I had a tour company there for a while. I was doing speaking events nonstop. I was doing like probably 50 to 100 speaking events a year there for a while and sponsors and commercials. And then in the end, you still break even. <laughs> if you're lucky. Even with all that work. <laughs> You're truly something you gas. need to love <laughs> <laughs> so that being said what what would be your biggest challenge you've experienced as a storm chaser or while you're storm chasing 
paying the bills definitely you know and uh staying afloat not getting audited by the irs and uh definitely the storm chasing itself you know the drives are definitely a challenge uh eating you can't really eat healthy on the road so that's definitely a challenge uh, dealing with the people working with friends you know friends will be the first people to backstab you once you're doing something good so i've lost dozens and dozens of friends over the years. And uh, I blame myself a lot for that too, because working with friends initially can be a struggle. So, you know, lost a lot of that and kind of gained insight into how we truly are as humans, which, you know, we really, all of us really probably aren't that great, you know, but people you know, suck. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 mean, I do too, you know, so <laughs> what can you do? But uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if I were to go back, I, I don't think I would work, you know, I, I don't know if I would work with uh, uh, your friends and stuff. You know, I think I'd probably just work solo my whole entire life. But to accomplish anything great, you need to have a team of very talented people working together. And the hardest part of storm chasing is keeping that team together mm. because eventually, you know, people in the team are like, well, I could be doing this myself much better. Well, I could be making this much by myself. And then eventually it starts to unravel, you know, and tear itself apart at the seams. But that's probably been the most difficult part is maintaining friendships and teams uh, through all of this. So who have been uh, your your three most influential people in your life, whether that be in storm chasing or outside of storm chasing or? Definitely Jeff Petrowski. You know, he kind of pioneered the extreme <laughs> storm chasing and his positivity and passion i would say you know a borderline mentor even except uh but more of an inspiration with storm chasing uh and tim samaris of course you know the self-taught engineer doing mm -hmm. his own science as well he was on our show storm chasers joel taylor of course uh my late best friend uh joel taylor incredibly influential on me you know as well mm -hmm. and uh dr lamb was my advisor in grad school so my mom the most important is my mom so she's the one that got me set on the path <laughs> of the sciences got me into insect collecting and you know definitely kind of opened the door for to let a natural passion for the sciences to take over and where i'm staying at my mom's right now in south carolina so you're, you're lucky you made sure to mention her otherwise she would have whooped you when you got home <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> what, what, when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up storm chaser yeah always a storm really chaser. yeah that is not too many people can say that that they're actually yeah. doing what they wanted to as a child yeah yeah i always wanted to be a storm chaser you guys too yeah <laughs> well true as a kid i don't think i did i was i was terrified of storms as a kid but <laughs> well, there's a fine line between fear and intense curiosity very fine i think it was line. about probably about 10 before i i started to enjoy them but at five i'm pretty sure i was scared <laughs> well i was probably afraid of them at five too <laughs> what's uh what's your favorite state or province to chase in I love chasing Canada. Uh, Saskatchewan, definitely in, Can in Canada. It's just a beautiful place. Saskatchewan is awesome. I haven't Jordan. seen those tornadoes there. I've seen all the tornadoes in Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> but my second favorite state, I love all the states, though. You know, I, I love Dixie Alley down here for, for what it is. You know, the grungy, it's good for the skin quality, all the moisture, too. It's good. <laughs> I love the high plains. I love the giant hill, the high plains. So I don't really have favorites. I, I just kind of love all, all places to chase. For, for well, I, I'm going to stick to Saskatchewan because you said it first, and, you know, that's just okay. that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> I love Alberta, too. I love the high plains insane of Alberta. <laughs> Ontario, it's harder. So, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Ontario chasing yeah i used to go there when we were 18 19 years old for the legal beer uh, <laughs> in our car we'd get up to the border and they'd be like sir why are you coming to canada we'd be like uh i i i, I don't know you know just go to visit you know like we all nervous and everything. yank us out of the car strip the whole car down and everything but if you would have just said we're coming to drink beer it would have been fine <laughs> <laughs> 
the guy that would drive, Josh Moxley was his name. He, he would always just show his anxiety. You know, his face would turn all red, start stuttering and everything. His hands were shaking on the wheel, even though there was no reason to. It was just something with going across that border when we were younger. Crossing the border can be scary sometimes. For sure. I do it quite often for work, and it still freaks me out every time I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing in the vehicle. I know I'm doing nothing wrong, and I'm still <laughs> my anxiety is through. That they can say no, you know, they can just yeah. say like, no, no, yeah. you're not coming yeah. in. It's just the, the the prospect of that. I think is what makes it fearful. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I probably already know the answer to this, but uh, snow, hurricanes, tornadoes, or structures. Which is your favorite? Tornadoes to chase. Close range. <laughs> That's what Both I figured. Range. But I enjoy the structure as I'm driving toward it. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't own a tripod. No? Really? No, hell no. I never will own a tripod. <laughs> so you probably don't stand still long enough to use one. No, <laughs> yeah. I've never believed in the concept of a tripod. I've kind of been against it. Because <laughs> I think you kind of have to stop chasing to set up a tripod. Yeah, it we- takes a while. Unless you got a minivan, then you leave it fully set. Just grab it and stick it out there and you're good to go. Yeah. (laughs) I do need to get some nice equipment someday, you know, still photography and tripods, but maybe once I get a little older and less aggressive, I'll I'll get some of those. (laughs) Uh, Time-lapse films. I'll I'll usually, like, set up a tripod and do a little bit of a time-lapse as things are getting going. You're seeing the updrafts go up and everything, but... Once that storm's happening, I don't think that tripod leaves my car. No. (laughs) You're a monopod. True. Yeah. There is those. They're nice and maneuverable. (laughs) Glorified (laughs) selfie stick. (laughs) It's a two by four with a quarter inch bolt stuck in it. (laughs) So, Reed, what is your biggest failure and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, man. Right? It's a heavy question. Yeah, one thing as storm chasers, I mean, we're very, you know, deeply familiar with failure. (laughs) uh, Jeez, I've made so many mistakes over the years. I don't even know where to start. Jeez, yeah. (laughs) That's how you know it was a good question. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, like 20 failures, you know. Uh, hundreds. I mean, I can't. Yeah, I would think, you know, business wise, I'm not a very good business person. I would, I would do better at paperwork. Of course, I ended up getting audited by the IRS and woke up to like a $350,000 tax lien in the mail. I have a workers comp that came after the tour company because I didn't classify my workers as employees instead of classified them as contractors. And that was another $300,000 bill that I woke up to in the morning and I had, you know, sheriffs that were delivering subpoenas at my place over that and friends that you know were tearing apart you know uh, everything stealing stuff out of my house tvn total collapse but just doing paperwork you know i think would be better and maybe not working with big teams just kind of you know taking my own path and uh or boy storm chasers too even just you know lots of errors there that associated with that but the key is to not dwell on your mistakes you know or you'll live an unhappy life you know, no, try for to sure. dwell on the good things Absolutely. but and from a science perspective you know i wish that i churned out all these papers right after storm season but you're also working doing sponsors churning out videos trying to graduate to begin with finally we have our rocket paper that's about ready to be published it's like 37 pages long. And the, the hard part is taking a big document like that and really shrinking it down mm. to uh, something that, you know, is, is acceptable by a publication. And now at this stage, now that I'm in my forties, you know, I've kind of worked so hard over the last 20 or 30 years that my brain is kind of fried out, you know, so you can't really uh, fix all those mistakes that you made in the past. And you just kind of have to chase and, and live storm to storm. Learn you know, from and grow. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, many errors. I think that, you know, you do, but you never want to dwell on that or you'll be pretty uh, upset. Right there, Chi T says, yes, learn from and grow. I mean, learn all the busts, grow. you know, I mean, man, I've had tens of thousands of busts and uh, you know, situations where I drove all the way up to Canada and didn't see anything. And 
I've had beater vehicles that have been trashed and I've had a divorce, you know, failed marriage. Obviously I wish that I worked better on that. So yeah, I mean, you know, never stop chasing comes with it, comes with a price. <laughs> it does. It does. So looking back at all the amazing weather events you've covered over the years, which one stands out the most to you or is the most important to you? Uh <clears throat> Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, um, definitely the rocket launch on May 28, 2019, just because we really broke through launching mm. a sensor into a tornado that actually worked, actually streamed the data back live. And that was definitely one of my favorite moments. And if it weren't for Canadians, we wouldn't have pulled it off. <laughs> we worked as a team, Sean Schofer, expert driving, kept us safe, got us right up in there. Mark launching the sensors, developing the sensors so that they work. Aaron J. Jack navigating, and uh, I press the big red button in the back seat. That launched <laughs> <laughs> if you won ten million tomorrow, what would you do with it? Dominator fly. Probably parlay it into some really low cryptocurrency or something and <laughs> buy an NFT. <laughs> buy one. Buy one of those board ape, ape NFTs and then put it on my Twitter profile. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I would uh I would donate a lot of it, honestly, you know, to feel better about myself. And uh, I would take the other half and uh, maybe build another dominator mass produce some sensors accelerate the dominator weather station process and create a web three space for storm chasing whether it be you know numerical models in 3d or uh, in a, a platform for a 360 degree tornado video something like that i hope you win 10 million dollars <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't be slinging as many weather reports. I would, I would just storm chase. There wouldn't be any weather reports. No weather reports, just pure chasing. I'd, I'd pay somebody to finish this publication. It's all the stuff I don't want to do. Someone else can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what, I think that's what most people would probably do with it. But I, I would donate as well, do you know, but... Even that, you know, could be viewed as a selfish act because you're just trying to make yourself feel better about yourself, you know. But I think it's also important to. Uh, You'll you know, never win, man. Help others. Yeah, no. you can't win. <laughs> You'll never make all the people happy all the time. Yeah, no. that is for sure. <laughs> so, what songs would we find on your storm chase storm chase playlist? Well, I like a lot of uh, Bob Dylan and Tom Petty. I like some old school rap. You know, like that Super Bowl halftime show. Oh. Like here right up my alley. 50 Cent dropped out of the oh. ceiling there. Looked that a little just... bigger than what I remember, but... <laughs> we, all, we all are. We all do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was good. Uh, some of those... Especially after there. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and some top 40. You know, I like the top 40 as well. And the, uh, yeah, so I, I'm starting to get into the new music too. I've been chasing with the Captain Van over the uh, World Champion Drone Racer too. He's like 22 years old, so they listen to whole totally different music. You know, it's, totally different. it's like uh, yeah, all those yeah. TikTok viral hits. Kind of, yeah, I think. <laughs> I'm banned from TikTok. All right, I've got one more post. I'm banned. Right now, I'm view only on TikTok until February 25th. What? Oh, wow. Yeah, every time I post a storm chasing video, they delete it. For really? A dangerous act or something. And oh, you, you've got to tell them that you're a professional. But then <laughs> sometimes they'll retain them and they'll, I'll, I'll appeal. They'll allow them to be up. And uh, like one video where it's obviously very dangerous and they allow that. And then another video where I'm like 10 miles Southwest where they're like, Whoa, this is a dangerous act. So there's no <laughs> consistency in the platform at all. And oh, yeah. man. I'm actually thinking about boycotting it. <laughs> you hear, heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> 
They're already throttling a community that's already hurting, you know? I mean, geez. Just yeah. Half. Garrett Beverly says, apparently you can eat Tide Pods, but you can't show storm chasing videos. Yeah, there's a lot of dangerous stuff Isn't on that TikTok that gets through. I mean, even just driving down the road is more dangerous, you know, technically than storm chasing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the people that run the platform, for some reason, just have a personal vendetta against storm chasing. I'm not sure what it is. I mean, we're already kind of bottom of the barrel, you know. The <laughs> just kick us while we're down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're just a passionate community, that's all. So this one might be a tough one, but uh, what is your favorite piece of equipment in your storm chasing arsenal and why? Well, I love the gravity wave sensors because they're relatively easy to deploy and you can still collect valuable data from them. Uh, the gravity wave sensors. I love the Dominator 4 also. And I love this new jacket. And the plus <laughs> tape, of course. I, I was hoping it. you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not sponsored. I wear this because it's a nice jacket. You know, and I like it. You know, I wear it in, in public. I, I have more confidence. You know, when I wear this jacket, I feel more confident and I feel better about myself. So I'm going to keep wearing it. <laughs> McDonald's, if you're watching, uh, hit up Reed. <laughs> I'll leave McDonald's anyway. <laughs> if you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? What would you Never want? Never stop be? chasing. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. That's it. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't need to be remembered for anything except that. Never stop chasing. I love it. What is one piece of advice you'd give to somebody starting out as a storm chaser? Well, the hardest part is getting to the target and showing up. Uh, it's important to show up, but the obvious advice that I have to give is know what you're doing first. Go with somebody that knows what they're doing. Attend a Skywarn training course. I kind of learned the wrong way. I just got in my car and started doing it and nearly got myself killed the first probably many years. Uh, including the <laughs> overpass on May 3rd, 99. But, and you can actually learn faster when you go with people that know what they're doing as well. So just get out there, start learning, watch a lot of videos. There are a ton of online resources these days. These days, So you can become an expert in forecasting. And some of the younger generations that are coming up are better forecasters than many meteorologists that I know just because of the information that's so readily available to everybody out there. So it's an mm -hmm. awesome thing to see. And Get out there, start doing it, start learning, do it safely. Of course, unfortunately, I can't recommend the path that I took just because of insurance purposes. <laughs> I guess I'd like get sued. <laughs> Not that I, have I definitely don't have insurance at all. But you know, and uh, some of the universities these days are kind of throttling storm chasing a little bit too. But you know, if I could give advice off the record, the hardest part is just to show up on the storm. You got to get out there and storm chase, but go with people that know what they're doing and then you can learn faster and survive. <laughs> That's helpful. Perfect. The That's the mentor as well. You know, I think there are a lot of storm chasers that, you know, maybe would be favorable mentors now, uh, especially because maybe when they started storm chasing, they were met with gatekeepers or people that were a little bit less willing to show them the path forward. So, there's probably a lot more mentors that are available for younger storm chasers that are getting into the field. And I would also recommend having a side plan, meteorology, going to school for meteorology and kind of have a, a backup plan just in case. Mm. And you can always proceed with that plan and storm chase on the side and grow <laughs> storm chasing on the side until it reaches a level to where you could do it full time. And so the key is to be patient as well, uh, but work really hard. But you know, at the same time, it's possible to ha have a job that may not be storm chasing, but grow storm chasing up until you get it. And so that's kind of the key, because right now with storm chasing, you basically have to work multiple, multiple jobs at the same time to really make mm. it. So there are people out there that are doing it. And uh, I'm thinking that as Web3 comes up, there's going to be a lot more paths forward for storm chasers, because the weather industry is huge. Everything depends on weather. Everything depends on content as well, kind of the last form of human expression. And storm chasing is such an art form in itself. It's almost a final form of human expression as well. Not only the mm. art form that we're generating, but the actual process, the hook slice maneuvers, the positioning southeast <laughs> to get the beautiful structure, the 
penetrating hail cores even and keeping your vehicle pointed into the wind is a is an art form in, in lots of ways and the video that we Absolutely. collect out there is science as well so you know i think that we need to broaden the definition of who's actually doing science and realize that even just collecting videos of tornadoes and any weather phenomenon is is an incredible aspect of science and data collection mm -hmm. so what year to date has been your most successful 2011 definitely in terms of the number of tornadoes <laughs> i had a feeling that was coming <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah 2016 was a good one but i was kind of juggling trying to get married in a relationship at the time so i missed a lot of those tornadoes as well and uh you know uh 2007 2003 were big years 2007 was bookended by the pipestone manitoba tornado up there 2003 and 2007 were both El Nino springs, which are mm. more dependable for being active because La Ninas can really go big, but I think that they're a little bit less dependable, a, a little bit of a, a more narrow window to get the tornadoes. Yeah, to for sure. So this is uh this will be the last question. Mm -hmm. What is one question that you wish we would have asked you? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> we've asked you a lot of stuff we've covered a lot of ground tonight man I don't know you guys uh, asked uh, <laughs> a lot of good questions <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. that's fine too yeah uh, about the fl flash floods and debris flows maybe something related to that which is kind of a passion that I learned from David Rankin was one of the original flash flood debris flow chasers. Rankin Studio is his YouTube page, but he grew up in uh, Big Water, Utah, predicting and tracking those debris flows and happened to teach me his craft. And uh, I've definitely really enjoyed chasing down these flash floods and debris flows in the Mountain West and in the desert Southwest, kind of thinking like a fluid combination of atmospheric sciences and geography and knowledge of topography. And it's relaxing also. It feels almost like a vacation to me when I'm chasing <laughs> those flash floods. Kind of like crystal hunting. <laughs> it's a little bit more relaxing and less competitive, which is nice. Get to unplug for a while and just enjoy doing something. Yeah. <laughs> well. There it is. <laughs> It is time for today's game show. And in honor of the McDonald's coat, we figured we'd go with a fast food theme for the trip. Okay. Tonight. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll ask a question and you'll get, it's, it's all multiple choice. So we'll give you four, four options to choose from. Okay. And we'll, uh, we'll see how you do here. So the first question is at what sub shop is known for its toast and subs? Is it Subway? Zero subs, Quiznos, or Jimmy John's? Subway. Did no. anyone want to guess in the comments? It is definitely Subway when you say, oh, can I get this toasted, please? Subway. <laughs> do we have a guess in the comments? We do yeah, have a winner. In the, it was, it's Quiznos, buddy. Oh, yeah. I disagree. Because they had the whole toasted <laughs> line. You can get a sub that wasn't toasted. No, I'm going to have to disagree. You can get Subway on Toasted. <laughs> so, originally found, wow. in a originally found in 1981, Quiznos specializes in toasted sub sandwiches. Subway, the largest submarine sandwich shop, eventually followed suit me in offering the option in 04. But they followed suit means that they're, are they known for it now? I guess probably. I guess okay. now, yeah. Fine, if you want to argue it. <laughs> That's what I do. If I get a wrong answer, I'll pack the test. <laughs> the professor is tall. Good lawyer there. <laughs> so question number two is, what is the oldest soft drink in the USA? Is it Coca-Cola? It's Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah, I think they invented, did they buy out Dr. Pepper? So, Wait. everybody knows the popular drink Dr. Pepper ever since it was created in the 1880s in Texas. Um, I bet even some people 
consider Dr. Pepper as the national drink of the USA? I still think they would guess Coke, but I love Dr. <laughs> I like Dr. Pepper. It's good. All of so it's no- good for you. My nieces are not even allowed to have Coke or any soft drinks. They've never had a Coke before. What? That? Yeah. Wow. One of them is 12 years old and she's never had a Coke. Oh, man. <laughs> They've been Look brainwashed out. into thinking it's bad, so I drink a Coke, and they're, like, shaming me. It's crazy. <laughs> Do you know what's in that? Yeah. <laughs> nope, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're the generation that grew up on high C Ecto Cooler, you know, the high C right? that was green, and we'd have a little bottle, like a, a little nipple that pulled the high C out of it every morning. Starting Pixie the day sticks. Off high and those corn syrup. <laughs> All right, number three. Where was the origin of pizza? Paris, France, Florence, Italy, New York, USA, or Naples, Italy? I'm thinking you guys put the Italy ones in there to throw me off, so I'm going to guess Paris, France. No, sir. (laughs) Zach Walters got it right. It is Naples, Italy. So we all wow. know that pizza belongs to the Italian dishes, but everyone should try their Neapolitan pizza, Italian cuisine. Well, this doesn't even, this wasn't even a fact. Sorry, <laughs> I, I copied this off the internet, so it's, uh, it, it is not a fact about Naples, it's just a fact about pizza. <laughs> Man, the news is coming in right now, it sounds like Russia has invaded Ukraine and officially declared war. Oh. Oh. Not good, I just got a photo of this big explosion on here. Damn it. Yeah. That makes the... Oh, yep. man. That's going to get bad. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> on that note... <laughs> bring down the trivia. <laughs> Question number four is, why did Kentucky Fried Chicken change its name to KFC? competitor sued them they did not like the word fried they were not really from kentucky or the government forced them to three not from kentucky (laughs) (laughs) competitor sued them no (laughs) they did not like the word fried (laughs) nailed it first try thank you So Kentucky Fried Chicken changed its name to KFC in 1991 because it planned to offer a more varied menu and wanted to eliminate the unhealthy connotation of fried from its name. (laughs) And it worked. Not sure how well that worked. (laughs) When did Taco Bell first open? 1961, 62, 63, or 64? I know it was somewhere between 1961 and 64. <laughs> we'll go with 64. No, sir. <laughs> Owner <61. Glenn. laughs> I should have known you guys would put it in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so, Owner Glenn Bell actually opened in 1962. Wow. Okay, you got to know this one, Reed. Okay. When was the first Happy Meal sold? 79? 79. One of these is not like the others. (laughs) Now this one, I actually had no idea that it was a, that it was even a thing. What fast food restaurant First envision was first envisioned during a figure skating competition. Was it Buffalo Wild Wings, Blimpies, Raising Canes, or Brahms? I'll say Blimpies. That's kind of a northern uh, sub shop. No, sir. <laughs> All right, I quit this thing. I don't know. <laughs> it was actually Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> I'm gonna eat my supper. I'm done with this game. <laughs> you got three more, buddy. You're almost yeah. there. You think the sour cream's still good? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It is vacuum sealed. 
It's not real cream anyway. So, what was the first Starbucks drink ever? A large black coffee, a cof- cafe latte, a caramel macchiato, or a green tea latte? Can you believe the- these are supposed to be Southwest egg rolls and it's like a whole roll? Usually it's supposed to chop those up. That's crazy. I've never seen a whole roll. I would say black coffee. Black coffee. I threw that in there just, just to get you. Okay. <laughs> Caramel macchiato. You're dancing on the edge. Okay. <laughs> Coffee latte. <laughs> All right, let's grind through these. All right, you got two more. You, you got this one. <laughs> what fast food was literally founded in a broom closet? Papa John's, Dairy Queen's, Subway, or McDonald's? I'll go McDonald's. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just guessing at random right now to get to these fajitas. <laughs> it, it's, it was Papa John's. It was actually founded in 1984 when Papa John Shatner knocked out a broom closet in the back of his father's tavern and sold his prized 72 Z28 Camaro to purchase $1,600 worth of used pizza equipment. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> right? That's good to know. <laughs> last right, one. Last one. Who invented deep frying? The French, Egyptians, Americans, or the Brits? I'm going to say the Egyptians. I would guess that it came from a long time ago. Finished strong. There we go. Finally. <laughs> Got it. 2500 <laughs> BC. Yeah. When did Applebee's open? Let me ask you guys a trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? The one in Regina? <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago? <laughs> so, Reed, where can people find you on social media? Uh, just Reed Timmer Accu on Twitter. There it is. Uh, Reed Timmer on Facebook. You can find us on there. So, you can't... You pro- I would suggest not finding me on TikTok, because I'm about to be banned <laughs> off of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, and you can follow us on our social media on, at Twitter or on Twitter. It's at the PDS Podcast. You can follow Jordan at Manitoba Storm Chasers on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm seven o at seven o six photos everywhere on the social. Please subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app, and if your player lets you, leave us a review. That really helps us jump up in the standings. And. Uh become a supporter on Facebook for the chance to win exclusive merchant prizes and don't forget to head over to mbstorm.redbubble.com for your Storm Chase apparel needs. Uh, make sure you tune in for episode 11 live on March 8th with special guest Jessica Moore. And thank you again to Reed for joining us tonight and for everybody who watched us live. Thank you guys so much. Thanks man. Appreciate it everyone. Have a, have a good night. It's an absolute honor being on the 